thanks. Uh, I guess I'll just ask to begin with, so who here thinks time and space are the enemies of business sustainability? Okay, who here thinks that they are the allies of business sustainability? So a lot of people don't have an opinion, is that right? <laughs> I'm going to force you into making an opinion now. Who thinks that time and space are the enemies? Come on, that's a few more people actually think that they are. And who think that, in fact, they're the allies, that they're a good thing? Okay, so we've got a kind of split, really. Okay, so I'm going to try and talk about the fact that time and space are the allies of business sustainability. If we look at... Yeah. You don't have anything between this four positions? <laughs> Say again? Any soft policy? Yeah, I have real soft policy. That's what I'm coming to now, exactly. Yeah. So I'm going to argue that um, they're the allies if you look at the problem in the right way. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I think if this was a traditional uh, kind of academic debate, we would be arguing one point versus the other quite hard. But we've decided to tone it down and kind of take a bit of a middle ground. So just for those people who love academic debates, it may be disappointing. For those people who like the middle ground, it might be more interesting. Okay, so I'm, uh, one of the things I was thinking about before I came in here was the way that the economy tends to work. And it's very kind of linear. We tend to dig something out the ground, turn that into a material or a product, sell that into a market, and then chuck it out at the end of its life. And this is kind of the throughput of GDP or economic growth in many instances. And through that process, we rely on very large quantities of mainly fossil fuel energy and mainly virgin inputs and commodities and resources. And since we started doing that kind of back in the 1900s at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we've seen the fasted period of human economic development in history. So it's been enormously helpful in terms of helping people to have the type of life that we have to do today, as Jeremy said. And there are a number of um, interesting factors about that, however, which are potentially problematic. So if we look at what we mean from a sustainability perspective, um, and I, I looked at a paper by Rockstrom that looked at what are the biggest planetary risks that we now have. And interestingly enough, climate change isn't number one. So number one, biosphere integrity. Number two um, is nitrogen and phosphate availability within the economy for food and farming. Number three is land use change. And number four is climate change. Um, and the more that we look into this topic, and you guys probably know this better than we do, working, being in the School of Geography, there are a number of risks and a number of elements that might make business as usual not uh, sustainable. And this is before we see an additional 3 billion more middle class consumers join the economy. And to put that in context, because it's a big number, that's the same number of people as there are in London, um, about 8 million people joining the economy every 32 days. So every month, the number of people in London consuming at the level that we do, which is pretty staggering. And so in one year, for example, we'll, it's the equivalent um, infrastructure development of 25 cities the size of Chicago being built, uh, which is mainly through China and India, every year on year on year. So the amount of throughput that we require to make that work is absolutely um, staggering. Um, so if time and space are, are, are the... Uh, if time and space are a factor, um, then my thought is that they are the enemies of business sustainability if we don't use that feedback. So if we don't use the feedback as to what is actually happening to feed back into the market system. And I think this is when it comes down to what we mean by time. So from a business context, and we're all people from businesses, five years is a really long time, right? A year is quite a long time. Five years is a really long time. 40 years, might as well forget about it. I mean, 40 years' time, it's outside of the scope of at least when I'll be in my job role and probably, you know, you're basically talking about very long cycles. Um, what I was interested in in this topic was actually we're probably wanting to look at an economy that works in hundreds, if not thousands of years' time. I mean, uh, living systems have existed for about 2.8 billion years. Um, humans have been on the planet for about 100, 200,000 years. And ultimately, I imagine that we would like to have a prosperous economy. We'd like to have human development in 100, 200, 1,000 years' time. So I was kind of pondering this question myself. And my thought was that if we use the current measure for progress, which is GDP, and we use that because it's easy to measure effectively. We've used GDP for a very long time. It's very easy to account for. We may have some issues. And my thought around that is that ultimately, 
as the system stands right now, we are not able to internalize many of the externalities in the system. Um, so, for example, if we go back to the points that I made earlier about ecosystem degradation, the um, current economy and the economic setup we have now leaks seven to eight million tons of plastics into the world's oceans each year. And that has an impact on uh, fisheries, it has an impact on aquaculture systems. And that's actually been measured by an organization called True Cost at being a many billion US dollar cost to the, to the economy. Um, so my uh, kind of take on this is that if you are able to actually internalize those externalities, then the market system will operate properly. And even more excitingly than that, I think there's two other developments that are happening simultaneously. One is the Internet of Things, which basically means that the cost of being able to, being able to sense many of these elements has been completely impossible in the past and not even worth thinking about. Whereas we know now that it is easy to sense many more variables, whether it's clean air, clean water, whatever that happens to be in the economy, in the future, it may be possible to internalize those and take them into account. The second is an area that I'm very interested, maybe slightly biased towards because I work in it, is the circular economy, where I believe that you can start to shift this linear take, make, dispose economy to one where, by design, you have a loop of technical materials which are designed by intent to cycle at the highest possible quality, which starts to decouple the manufacturing economy from the use of energy. And in the biological side of the economy, we start to design flows of biological nutrients to be able to restore and add value through the bi biosphere. And in this instance, I think to quote Michael Braungart, one of the authors of a book called Cradle to Cradle, he says, he talks about uh, sustainability. And he says, if I told you that th my relationship I have with my wife was sustainable, what would you think? And his point is ultimately you need a lens for innovation that goes beyond just surviving and being sustainable and you need a way of looking at building a future economy which is better than today's. So my thought is this does work but you need to change the system operating conditions so the market system internalizes the externalities and you need to look at the world from a different lens of innovation. So thank you. <laughs>